and God's presence in our lives. Today I want to speak to you about a very important subject to my heart, and that's called Pursuers of Peace. And we're going to be looking in one particular passage of Scripture as our opening text, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. And we'll read there in just a moment. I have a true story to share with you. A retired couple was alarmed by the threat of nuclear war, so they undertook a serious study of all the inhabited places on the globe. And I say inhabited places on the globe. Their goal was to determine where in the world would be the best place to, be, to, to least likely be affected by a nuclear war, a place of ultimate security. They studied and traveled and traveled and studied, and finally they found the place. Remember, this is a true story. They found the place. And on Christmas, they sent their pastor a card from their new home in the Falkland Islands. However, their paradise was soon turned into a war zone by Great Britain and Argentina. Some of you know your history. They thought they could find a safe place, but it wasn't. You know, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And one more story. Ramsay MacDonald, a one-time prime minister of England, was discussing with another government official the possibility of a lasting peace. The latter, an expert on foreign affairs, was unimpressed by the Prime Minister's idealistic viewpoint. He remarked cynically, the desire for peace does not necessarily ensure it. This MacDonald admitted by saying, quite true, but neither does the desire for food satisfy your hunger, but at least it gets you started toward the restaurant. <laughs> Today, we are to be pursuers of peace. Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Everybody say rule. rule. I'm going to look at that in a moment. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Folks, you've been called to it. And be thankful. Father, thank you for these words to our heart, even as we read the scripture, Lord, may it speak and may the Holy Spirit guide us in this time together, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, a few weeks ago, I spoke to you briefly from the book of Jude. I had a heart-to-heart -heart with you, and those of you that were here heard my heart, and then I referenced uh, for a while from the book of Jude. And I pointed out to you how divisiveness would be a sign of the last days and would even try to invade the church. Now, folks, I will tell you as your pastor, I am so thankful that I, as your shepherd, do not sense a spirit of divisiveness among us. And I thank God for that. But I believe that it's also important for us to see what the Word has to say about things like this, about the need to let peace rule in our hearts, because we live in a world that's very divisive. And so God wants us to have some scripture, have some practical things to help us because we're encountering the world every day, aren't we? And, and so how does God want to help us in this area of our life? And so I want to share with you some practical ways for us to recognize divisiveness and how to be a pursuer of peace. How many want to be a pursuer of peace? Wave your hand and say amen. amen. Good, I love seeing the hands. So important for us who love God. Paul understood the destructiveness of divisiveness in relationships and the church and even in the church. And so he admonishes us and admonishes them to let peace rule in their hearts. Peace is connected to a decision of your heart and of your will. It must rule there. So I take a moment and I point out what this word rule really means here in this text. And it's only found, and I noticed this when I studied it, this word is only used one time in the entire New Testament. This one particular word in the Greek translated rule. 
If you go through your translations of your Bible, guess what? One translation after another translation after another translation uses the word rule. What does that mean? If this is supposed to be in your life, this peace. The word translated rule actually means to arbitrate, to settle a disagreement, to reach an authoritative judgment. Hmm. You know, you look at this verse of Scripture and immediately, what is the first thing we think about? Yeah, I need to have peace in my heart, right? An inner peace. Let it rule there. And so when we think of peace like that, and I've preached a message in the last year on that very subject, I want to have peace in time of trial and tribulation and turmoil and testing, right? But there's another aspect of peace that we see here evident in the words of Paul. It is to rule in your heart, and he's talking in the context of relationships. Because if you read this ver the verses prior and after, you will find he's talking to the church, and he uses the plural of heart. He says hearts. So what is he saying? He's saying, church, let peace rule among you. Let it be a part of who you are, as he speaks about the body of Christ. It concerns relationships. And I know we could take it a bit further than just the church. How many of you think peace should rule in your families? Right? Peace should rule, married couples, in your marriage. <laughs> Let it rule there. Because, hey, husbands and wives, you've had disagreements, right? Come on, don't be all righteous on me. Come on. And you've got to have somewhere, you've got to let peace have its way. So, and of course, we know in our world, we definitely need peace, don't we? Well, peace is referred to as one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I won't read it to you this morning, but you can write it down. The fruits of the Spirit. Again, both for an inner peace, but also in how we react and how you respond to others. Whether it be a conversation that's being had, maybe it's something in the workroom, on your job, on your work site. Maybe it's a conversation at school, conversation that you have in the grocery store. It could also be in the day of social media, what you read as you're scrolling through your social media. Right? Think about it for a moment. How do we react and how do we respond as followers of Jesus Christ? You're different than the world. In today's world, we need to be pursuers of peace. I'm going to share with you some reasons why we are to be pursuers of peace. And the first one, I love the first one. Because when you're a pursuer of peace, it brings blessing to your life. You're a, you receive blessing from being a peacemaker. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And I'm going to read that to you. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Church, if we are individuals that desire peace in lives, to settle disagreement, to come to understanding, to bring emotions under control, there is blessing that comes with it. I want you to think about that for a moment. Isn't it nice when you can put your head up to bed and you're like, man, I was at peace with people today. And you, you sleep really good. If you had trial, if you had conflict all day, how many you sleep really good at night? It, does, it doesn't happen, does it? You're stewing, you're thinking, your mind is wandering, and you're like, man, i got to settle this. And there's an uneasiness there. But there's a blessing that comes to the peacemaker, the pursuer of peace. Personally, being a pursuer of peace leads to, leads to a happiness of life. 
I notice that with people that are not up to cause trouble. They're out to mend people's hearts. They're out to bring people together instead of tearing people apart. Uh, there's a happiness that comes. Peter goes on in this passage in chapter 3 that we read a moment ago and quotes from Psalm 34 and verse 2. Psalm 34, verse, or excuse me, 12 rather. Where we read that the testimony of those who are blessed for being promoters of peace includes this. And you can read it in Psalm 34, verse 12 or back in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you read this. The promoter of peace includes a love of life and you will see good days. How many want a love of life and see good days? Amen? What are you to be? A pursuer of peace. What does this mean? You won't be miserable. Anybody love being miserable? I sure don't. You're, if you're a pursuer of peace among brothers and sisters and relationships and family, uh, you're not going to be miserable. You're actually going to have a family get together and you're all going to get along. Churches get together and we all get along. We have great times. But I don't want to have a full, I don't want to be full of discontent or have anger, unresolved anger or fretting or living on the edge. So I always live on the edge with people. Having frayed nerves. Living life always with speculation of intent and motive. That's not what the Lord wants for our lives, church. And certainly not amongst the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus came to give us abundant life. Abundant life. A life of a peacemaker is a life of blessing. And the Lord blesses His church who pursue peace. But there's also a blessing that pertains to that which is public. There's personal, but publicly. And I bring this to our attention this morning. Because publicly, when we are living as pursuers of peace, we demonstrate or promote the gospel and the witness of Christ. Disagreements among followers of Christ have the potential to compromise our gospel witness to others. How we respond to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ the world is watching us. Whether you are in person, here as a body, or out in the world that we live in, or whether it be on social media, however we respond to one another is a testimony of where we're at with Christ. How many want to win people to Jesus? And so to be a pursuer of peace, bridges the gap, if you will, makes a bridge to the unsaved so that you can give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense this morning? Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Paul does something. You know what Paul does? He calls out the personal disagreement in the church. The lack of peace between two ladies. And you know what he has the nerve to do? He shares their names with us. Can you imagine that? For generations to come. For the whole church to know. Because by the way, the letter to the Philippian church was to be read aloud to the whole congregation. Evidently, they knew there were two ladies in their midst that were having a biff with each other. They were having an issue. And it got back to Paul. So he had to write about it. He was moved by it. He told the church, and he names them, Euodia and Syntyche, or however you want to say her name. He pleads with them, please agree with each other in the Lord. It doesn't mean you have to agree on the color of the carpet. But just please agree together in the Lord. In other words, they needed to get along and stop quarreling and finger pointing. Hmm. Does that ever happen today? Unfortunately, it does. I've pastored a long time now, Pastor Berger. The years go by, and I know you've experienced it over the years. We're human beings, human nature, and sometimes that gets the best of us. 
But the world is watching us, church. They're watching you. Don't be consumed with finding fault. After all, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call it the love chapter, says love keeps no record of wrongs. Even if you think you're right, still don't keep track of wrongs. Don't nitpick over things that would cause others to pull away from the church and be turned off by your witness. If now more than ever, do I have a witness to this? Now more than ever, the world needs to see a church flowing in peace. Letting it rule in our lives. We live in a very volatile time in our lives and we as a church must show the example. Can I get an amen again? Come on, church. You see, I have felt so impressed to share this with us because the enemy is the author of divisiveness. He's the author of anger and resentment and all the other things that go with it. But be blessed because you're a pursuer of peace and with others. Secondly, pursuer of peace promotes the gospel and the gospel is a gospel of peace. The grace of God is dependent upon it. What do you mean by that? Because you know, you're saying, Pastor, you're attaching something to the grace of God. And what I mean by that is what I read in Romans 12, 14. And that may help us here. Romans 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Not just the ones that you, you agree with. But with all men. And to be holy. In other words, watch what you say. Watch what you type. All that kind of stuff. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to defile many. So what are we saying here? That this grace of God can be missed if we allow bitterness and anger and divisiveness to well up in our soul, to well up in, in families or in churches as a witness to the gospel of peace. It's your responsibility and mine to let our witness testify to the grace and forgiveness of God. Can I get an amen to that? Don't ever, church, don't ever allow your disagreements and disputes bring about a discrediting of your witness. You know, your witness can be discredited. Let your words and your, and your actions be seasoned with grace. It's like pulling out that seasoning. There's a seasoning called grace. How many of you might need a little bit more of that right now? Lord, please help me. <laughs> I need some more seasoning of grace in my life. Grace. What is that? You're filled with Christ-like love and mercy. Are you thankful for that this morning in your life? Being a promoter of the gospel of peace means the witness of Christ is displayed through actions, through acts of peace. This is Romans 12, 18, 19. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. Hmm. I'm talking about an action here. I'd like to point out that others may not always receive your um, that others may not receive your actions of peace toward them, but you should at least do your part. Whether they receive it or not, you do your part. Let's say you're in a discussion and that you find that it's becoming a little bit combative. No one's ever been there, right? Married couples, everybody, it gets to be a little tense. You're in a discussion, a disagreement, a little bit combative. Back off. Everybody say, back off. <laughs> back off. That's your part. Their reaction is up to them and vice versa. However, whatever relationship you're in, responses are up to you. You also know this. If someone has mistreated you or given you a label, or said something unkind to you or about you. 
It's not up to you to get even with them. Do your part to live at peace with everyone. Isn't that what Paul said? If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. And thirdly, as a promoter of the gospel of peace, the presence of God is delighted in the midst of those united. God today is blessed. How many want to just bless Him? I want to bless my Lord. He is blessed when His children are getting along with each other. How many of you as parents always love it when your kids are getting along? <laughs> You're like, did you see that? No one's fighting. <laughs> Everybody's happy. Nobody's grabbing everything else for themselves. It's great, isn't it? How many of you want to bless the Lord this morning? Say, Lord, your kids are getting along. We're having a great time. We're in unity. And God says, oh, I want to bless them for that. It's awesome. Whether it's a marriage. You know, God will bless a marriage. Well, husband and wife, get along with your families, with the church. And can you imagine in our country if we'd all work together better than what we've been doing lately? God would bless us. Man, we'd, he'd, he'd knock our socks off with his blessings, really. <clears throat> God moves by his Holy Spirit among people who are united. We know that in the day of Pentecost. They were all in one accord. We're admonished in 1 Corinthians 11 that if anyone has any ought against one another that that needs to be made right, he even said before you take of communion, before you take of the Lord's Supper, because we're a body, the body shouldn't be at odds with one another. It's a, it's a bad witness and testimony of what Jesus came to do. So, I'll tell you something. It's going to be really hard for you if you ever get get in a place where you got some issues with others and they're not resolved and you're worshiping the Lord. Because I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit's going to work on you double time. And you're going to be like, how can I do this? i got to get this right with so-and-so. At least I must do my part. That's what Paul said. As much as it depends on you. You can't be accountable for the other person's response but you must do your part. But God is delighted in that. Now, in looking at the importance of being at peace with others, it's also good to look at the root causes of divisiveness. What are the root causes of it? Well, we have a scripture that we can go right straight to found in the book of James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. In other words, you're, you're not coming to God. You're, you're trying to figure it out on your own. And you try to figure it out on your own and get what you want, you're going to be messed up anyway. It's just not going to work right for you, right? So then comes the quarreling and the fighting and, and all of this. James makes it clear that there are two sources of division from this passage in James 4. First, I would call disagreements. Disagreements over being recognized. That's where I think about disagreements. How come I didn't get recognized and they did? It started out when we were kids, mom and dad. Well, you didn't see what I did, but you're rewarding them and you get all bent out of shape and you have disagreement because of recognition. We see that in adult worlds today, in the adult world. Or decisions that are made. You don't like the decision that so-and-so made. It can stir real easy on the job. The boss makes a decision, and people take sides. And all of a sudden, we have divisiveness stirring. We have a sense of lack of good morale in the, on the team, or amongst the work group, or whatever. It can happen in families and marriages as well. So-and-so makes the... I make the decisions in my house. I am married. My wife and I do it together. Okay? That has to be that way. That's how we do it. Opinions can get us all into, into trouble. Our preferences. All these things that come from disagreements. Because secondly on this, it's your desires. You want to be right. You want... Come on, church. How many of you just like to be right once in a while? 
I look at Julian and says, mark it down. You said I was right. <laughs> yeah. We want to be right. That's the human nature. No one wants to walk around, I'm wrong all the time. No, I'm, I'm right. Yeah. But that can get us into trouble. He says, you want something. You want to have something so desperately that it can cause division in your life, your relationships with one another. And so I say to you, church, we have to be. There's no option here. We must, in our hearts, want to pursue peace with each other. You should want that. Jesus, for the punishment of our peace, was put upon Him that brought us peace was put upon. We were at enmity with God and Jesus says, I'm going to bring you an everlasting peace. I'm going to bring you a peace in your heart that you could no longer, you can't have except through me and my precious blood on the cross. And because we have peace in our hearts, inner peace with God, it will flow out to others. It must. And finally, the third reason to be a pursuer of peace is it strengthens relationships when peace rules your heart. Relationships are strengthened when peace rules your heart. Now I go back as 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter was quoting in his passage there from Psalm 34. And I want to go to Psalm 34 and verse 14 where he says, Turn from, another translation puts it, Depart from, what? Evil and do good seek peace and pursue it the context of psalm 34 as it is also used in first peter chapter 3 has to do with relationships with one another turn from evil he says decide today to have nothing to do with divisiveness divisiveness are you ready is the evil you must turn from Depart from it, he says, in the context of relationships. Titus chapter 3, you can read it on your own in verse 10. Paul tells Titus to protect his heart from the dangers of a divisive spirit that can creep into his life. Church, don't let it latch itself onto you. Are you with me? Depart from it. Say, I, have, I don't want to be a part of that. Watch out for a divisive person that could be a part of your life. Be careful. So how do we know who a divisive person is, you ask? If I'm, if I'm supposed to turn and depart and flee from because I know the dangers of getting swept up into it, what do I do? Well, who is this person? I did a little digging. Let's see about this definition of a divisive person. Divisive person is one who intentionally, actively, and repeatedly rubs raw the resentments of people within a community, fans the hostilities of many people, searches out controversy and issues rather than avoiding them, and stirs up dissatisfaction and discontent that's a definition i came across would you think that's pretty accurate some of us here today may wonder pastor have i ever been divisive i hope not have i ever let me just give you a few things to consider i'm going to mention these because i believe that these are good facts you can be totally different than someone and not be a divisive person would you agree? I can look at Pastor George and say, I am not a Chiefs fan, and you're wearing it on your face. Broncos. Broncos. Sorry. Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh with me. Laugh at me. Whatever you want to do. I won't be offended. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm still a Lions fan, and he's wearing this and reminding me that he's a Broncos fan. We can be different, but we don't have to be divisive. Right? Separate game day for that, right? Now, you can think 
practically in your life the things that make you different from one another. But you know what? I'm glad that we're not all cookie cutters of each other anyway. And you might actually perceive things in life different than somebody else, but you don't have to be divisive about it. You can disagree passionately with others and not be a divisive person. You can be the lone voice of reason and biblical principle. Some of you might feel that. Maybe you're in a, on a job situation. You're like, I'm the only one here that has this biblical principle. I'm the only one here that has this sense of reasoning. I feel like I'm standing out against the crowd. Have you ever felt that way? But you don't have to be a divisive person. Think about that. Whether it's in the world we live in, in the church, I got to tell you something, in my 17 years here, we've not always, all of us, 100%, always seen things the same way. That shouldn't surprise any of us. We're different, right? You might like music this way. Somebody wants music that way. Somebody wants, you know, the decorating to be done this way. Somebody wants the decorating to be done that way. Somebody wants church to start earlier. Some want church to start later. Do you see what I'm saying? But we don't have to be divisive. Psalm 34. Let's not copy the way of the world, church. We're different than that. Psalm 34, 14. Again, I come back to it on this turning from evil. He says, depart from it or turn from it. This evil, this divisiveness means, here it is, folks. It's right there in front of you. And you have to make a choice, a decision. If you turn from something, if you depart from something, it means many times you're staring it in the face. You're in a conversation with a group of people and you're staring it, you're hearing it, it's filling your senses. You're, you feel your blood pressure going up. You know what I'm talking about? Turn from it, depart from it. I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to be a participant of something that is, are you ready? Evil. That's called for what it is. That's what the scriptures say. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he says, flee the very appearance of evil. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, rolling, I'm scrolling through social media. There are times I'm like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. That's divisive. Not going to do it. Why? Because I don't want to get into the trap. I don't want to ruin my witness. And by the way, I want to sleep good at night. <laughs> I, I, I just want to have be at peace and at rest. And I want my testimony to be such that people see me the next day and uh, they know who I truly am. They know my heart. You're a person that loves peace. And the fruit of the Spirit is evident there. Okay? There are times you have to make a decision. Will I meditate on this? Will I entertain this? Will I let something fester in my spirit? Or will I decide that it's something that I need to let go of? I need to leave it alone. There are times you just need to decline the invitation to engage in a conversation that's divisive. Are you with me? Amen. Another way to let peace rule in your heart, do good to others, he says in Psalm 34. Do good to others. This is good. Redirect your emotions, your will, your purposes in a way that demonstrates your faith and love in tangible ways that will bring glory to God. Sometimes we've got just too much time on our hands and that just kind of stirs us up, right? Let the fruit of the spirit of peace rise up into finding ways of expression of blessing to someone else. I got an idea for you. How about doing good to the one in whom you disagree with? That'll help a lot. Even if they don't receive some of what you're trying to do, as much as is it possible, be at peace. Demonstrate. Have the bigger heart. The third and final way to let peace rule in your heart is seek it and pursue it. Don't be like a person who's always looking to stir up strife. Be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Pastors will tell you in the church. Pastor Berger, you know what I'm saying. Pastor George, 
Pastors like to pastor people that are peacemakers, not troublemakers. It makes life a lot easier. We get along and we minister together and the gospel goes forward. And God is blessed and pleased. Look for it. Seek for it. Let it be a part of every relationship. And let me not discount something that's very, very important. Pray for it. Some of you say, Pastor, pray for me. I'll pray for you. We have to seek it together. There can be no complacency about striving for peace. You know why? He says this, pursue it. Pursue it. Not just sit back and wait for it. You've got to be a pursuer of it. John Wesley said it this way, Do not only embrace it gladly when it is offered, but follow hard after it when it seems to want to flee away from you. There must be, church, an eagerness, a diligence with the seeking. And in closing, a gentleman by the name of Daryl Record, a Christian apologetic and missionary. I came across his writings this week. And I thought, I need to share this with you. I don't claim this as my own, but I'm going to share it with you. Three simple ways to seek peace and pursue it. Number one, don't get angry. Does that sound simple? Wow, I thought this is really profound. And it's simple. How do you seek peace? Don't get angry. When there's a disagreement, an issue of conflict, you have the bigger heart. Don't let that cause divisiveness. Proverbs 15, 1 says... And I, I put it up there on the notes, but here it is. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. I came across an interesting quote that said, The beginning of strife is letting out the water, so abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. Number two, don't be on the lookout for things to divide. Some people just want the drama of it all. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Man, I, I, I tell you, we're, the Lord and the fruit of the Spirit in our life says, I, I'm not on the lookout for stuff like that. There's enough out there that comes at me. I don't have to go looking for it. I have a good word for you. Don't let yourself be controlled by the insults of others. Think about it. Many years ago, there were guys who spent all their time thinking about computer and software. We called them nerds and computer geeks. You know what we call them today? Billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about that for a moment. Thirdly, don't give in to the pull. It's pull on your life. Say, no, I won't be a part of that divisiveness. Because divisiveness, friends, can become addicting and controlling. The desire to always be right is very, very powerful. Lord, help us. Don't ever give up. Be a pursuer of peace with others, church. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There's the blessing that comes by being a peacemaker. And I want it and so do you. I want the blessings of God on my life to love life and to see good days. God will do that for you. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the world around about you. You can make a choice today, either whether you're going to get wrapped up in divisive things or say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to take that ground that says, Lord, I'm going to be a pursuer to bring peace. I gave you a message today of some very practical things. If you need to hear it again, go online. Share it with somebody else. Some of you were busy taking notes. You saw I put a lot of notes up there. I told Mark, I got a lot of slides today, <laughs> and he kept up with them. Be a promoter of the gospel of peace in your witness. Say, I got to be a better witness. People are watching me. They watch what I say, and they watch what I post. And I want to be a great, amazing witness for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I don't want to be known as a, a person who brings divisiveness, but of peace. And thirdly, that goes to that point. It strengthens our relationships with others so that you can enjoy the abundant life that Christ has called you to. So I want you to do this with me. I want you to bow your heads. We're going to come and sing a closing song, a chorus. Maybe it's one we've done already. I'm not sure. But I want you to just bow your heads with me, and we're going to close in prayer. 
But as we do, this is our time once again to make an altar before the Lord. I'm talking to you, sharing with you by the Holy Spirit how important it is that you be a pursuer of peace. You know, not only is your personal life on the line, so to speak. I mean, God's dealing with our personal life. But God really wants you to be a better witness, a greater witness in the days to come. God's empowering the church and calling the church. Lord, help us to take this message of the gospel of peace. How can we take the message of the gospel of peace if we can't be at peace with each other? We have to be. Lord, it's less of us and more of you. Lord, help us. Help each of us. Think in your own life. Maybe there's people in your own life you say, man, we're not really at peace with each other. There's something going on here that's divisive and hurtful and, 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 and we're fretting. And Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you need to do as far as it is possible with you. What can you do to be a vessel, a minister of peace? Oh God, help us. Help each of us. Help the church. Do you have relationships that need to be mended? Ask the Lord for help right now. Oh, Jesus, help us. Forgive us. Forgive us for our need to always be right. God, help us. Humble us. Cause us, even in our hearts, to be repentant of it when those moments come up. Say, God, help me. Help us to be an example of Jesus Christ. I'm praying for you right now. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm going to tell you, every one of us needs this word today. God, let your grace come upon us right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for us today. I pray, Father, that, Lord, as we go forth today, Lord, that our life, our conversation, the way we live our life would show forth and demonstrate a life of peace in Christ. Lord, let the church be a light and an example. And, Lord, I pray for us today that as we go, and if there are individuals and relationships that, Lord, need to be mended, that peace would endure. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. We'll not give the devil a foothold. We'll not run into it, but we will pursue peace with all that's within us. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. I pray, church, I pray that God give you divine appointments this week. That God will give you a word on your lips. That God will speak through you this week as a vessel for Him. That you would be the temple of the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit of God would flow through your life in a great way. I believe for a harvest of souls through each of our lives this week. That God gets all the praise. And God gets all the glory. And the kingdom will expand in Jesus' name. And that you experience the blessing of being a peacemaker. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen.